Okay, thanks very much, Elise. And yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. So my name is Nathan Spruce. I am the General Manager of Innovation for Impact Community Services in Bundaberg. So we are a, um, a not-for-profit that operates around 20 to 25 different government contracts, including um, two social enterprises. So we have a, a commercial laundry and we also operate the recycling for Bundaberg Regional Council. Uh, and our vision and mission is to, um, it's very short and sweet, it's all about improving lives. So everything that we do here leads back to that vision and mission, including um, what we do with the grants writing. Um, so my role here, um, I have, it has, it's broken into three different areas. Um, so uh, the first one is to create 180 of me um, across the organization. We have 180 staff. Um, innovation is threaded right the way across every division here. It is not just, um, uh, it's not just one person's responsibility. We believe everybody can, everybody has the right to have a go at that and to be able to test, try, fail, test, try, succeed, um, and just keep that going in a circular motion. Um, the other part is about external partnerships, finding out about how other organizations um, use innovation and then being able to take what they've done and synthesize that back into the organization here. And the third piece is around the, the tender writing. So um, as an organization, we made the strategic decision a very long time ago to have an in-house tender writer. Um, that was because um, we'd also made the decision to be able to diversify um, the, 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 the streams and the programs that we have here. So we have um, uh, federal employment services, a job active and a TTW. We are our own RTO. We are a skilling Queenslanders for work provider. We have disability programs, a community choir, uh, NDIS provider. Uh, we have the, the two social enterprises. We have a community health service. Um, so there is always something on the go and through the grants process that we've set up, there's genuinely or generally always something to be going for. Um, so for us, it made a real sense to have a, a full-time in-house tender writer. So I've actually handed that mantle over to a colleague of mine, Adam, uh, who stepped into the, the tender writing role. And then I pro um, provide the support with him as we, tra as we transition him fully into that. So, but it's something that I enjoy doing. Um, I will put my hands up now and say, I am not a writer by trade. I have no journalistic background um, or anything like that. Um, I just have uh, a real desire to solve problems, um, really getting intimate with the problem, which is something that I'm going to cover as part of the, uh, the session that we've got today. Um, and I have an imagination to be able to see possibilities. My role here allows me to just let my imagination run wild to the point where my colleagues are trying to tether me back down. Um, and one of the ways that I write, or one of the, my key um, key strategies is whenever I am formulating an idea, I write without any kind of boundaries. So um, I know what I'm trying to achieve. I know what I'm, the outcomes that I'm looking at. I'm not worried about the solution yet, but I will write without boundaries and I will write as if there's infinite money, there's infinite resource, there is infinite personnel. Because personally for me, I find it a lot easier to be able to rein that in than to start with something that is really restricted and try and move it out because then your imagination has already been constrained to what you're looking at. So that's one of the things, and I'll touch a little bit more on that. Um, I wanted the session to be quite fluid. Um, so please, um, Elise or Rach, if, if you can monitor the, um, the chat box for me as well in case I, I miss anything, that's great. Um, because I find that writing is a very personal, um, a personal skill. Um, and I toyed with the idea of actually doing some different kind of writing skills and writing exercises today. But I find that writing hypothetically can be quite difficult because you haven't got the passion. Yeah, there's not a pain that you're thinking, how am I going to solve this? 
Um, and I really think that one of those two are really important when you're writing. There's either a pain that, you, that, you, that you've got yourself that you're trying to solve for someone else, or there is a passion that you are trying to create some kind of change around. Um, so I decided to shelve the, um, uh, shelve the writing exercises. But what I will do is, if there is anybody in the session today that is currently working on something, thinking about looking at a particular grant and they want a bit of a sounding board, or if they want a critical review of it, um, again, under a, a commercial and confidence um, agreement or however that wants to be set up, I'm more than happy to have that chat with people individually outside of the session here, because I think people will get more value from that when we're talking about something that they can actually relate to than talking about one person's idea that somebody else in the group has really got no interest in. Yeah? So I didn't really think that, that was going to be a valid use of time. Um, but what I wanted to start with is um, for us, it is really about getting, um, getting intimate with the problem. So when we, when we first uh, identify a tender opportunity um, and there's a full course on this, there's a 10 program course that I've written and put together that's on the QSEC um, learning portal. So another plug for that, there you go, Elise. Um, um, but we, we go through a separate process of actually identifying the grants, being very brutal, making sure that they align to our vision and mission so that once we know we're working on something, we haven't got to worry about that. Um, but then what we like to do is to really try and understand the problem. And I've got two examples that I'll work through and then I'll, I'll show you the worksheet that we actually use. I can make that available then at a later date because what we found is that if you actually understand the problem fully, and not just jump straight to the solution, because we've all done that. Uh, and we ran a session yesterday internally where people were jumping straight to the solution. And it's no, let's rein you back in. Come on, let's understand the problem first. So I'm just going to share the screen a minute on the, the processes that we go through. Um, and I think it is this one. Yeah. So you should see there something that says getting intimate with your problem. Okay. Um, so what we found is that people take the problem at face value uh, and they look at it just what's in the tender document without actually fully exploring it. So what we like to do is as a group, um, everybody completes this. Different people complete it. Um, have a look. So I'm just seeing I've got some over here somewhere in my pile. I'll dig them out in a minute. But did we, we get people to complete these individually as well. Um, and we use this to identify uh, community opportunities for, for other projects internally. So we like to say, right, what actually is the problem or the opportunity based on the current understanding? So the different people that are involved in our tender team, they would complete this because I guarantee you now, you get six people in a room, you are not going to get six of the same answers because I will see it one way. You'll get the practitioners that will see it from a clinical or from a service way, if that's the way that we're going. Service delivery, somebody will be jumping right to the end and won't worry about any of the interventions. So we try to describe that in as many words from as many different angles as possible. And that really allows us to flesh out the size and the enormity of the problem and allows us to choose which bits we want to tackle on. Okay. Why does this need to be solved and addressed? Is there this helps us dig out the data that we need to be able to substantiate the answer from the vendor. Because the vendor has told us it needs to be solved for one reason, but if we can add two or three other reasons why it needs to be solved, we're adding more weight to the argument and showing that we uh, better understand the problem that the vendor is putting forward. Um, who is it a problem and opportunity for? Again, building on point two. Um, is it just the is it just for the uh, the people that have been or the clients that have been identified by by the vendor, or can we actually add more value to it? Describe why this is a problem or opportunity for them. So not only the why, now the who, but why is it the problem? Okay, and if you notice, we haven't done anything with the how yet. Okay, all of this will start to build, and it builds into a very linear process for us. Um, so describe why it is a problem. Again, this can be drawings, it can be just words, 
but it, it's a real way of being able to formulate everybody's um, everybody's idea and insights. What happens if it's not solved? Okay, so this is the this is the doomsdayer approach. But if we don't solve this, what's going to happen? And we use future forecasting to be able to say the data is going, if we extrapolate the data, this is what is going to happen. Okay. We then try and predict beyond what the vendor is trying to tell us. Why are we interested in our solving the problem? This comes back to the alignment to vision and mission for us and about how we want to improve that particular client group or that particular service. And what is the value of solving the opportunity? So this here is where we look at it from a social and an economic perspective. What is the social change that can be provided? And what is also the economic change? So we try to make sure that they are both articulated, but everybody in the room will see that from a very different perspective. So we like to make sure that we understand that from as many different angles before we start moving through into the solution process. Because what we found for us is that if the more time that we spend on this, the better the clarity of the service model and the end result. If I can translate that into figures for you, um, in the past five years, um, I'd achieved on average a 66% success rate with the tenders that we've gone for. Um, the, uh, the average is around about 10%. And I know I'm not gonna get them all, and I'm, I'm good with that. Um, and our feedback is a separate thing that I'll come back to in a minute. But really understanding this has been one of the key strategies that has enabled us to be able to build a better profile and be able to build us a better service model to be able to take to a co-design group so that when we test it with the end user, that we're getting the best possible product and the best possible solution to the problem because it is more evidence-based and it's more rounded. And it's not just me sat down as a group. And I realize as well, that this can be quite difficult. I'm just gonna stop sharing the screen a minute, but I'll share that document later. Um, I understand it can be very difficult as well if you are the lone tender writer. Um, some organizations don't have that resource and are not able to operate the way that we do here. That doesn't stop you bouncing the idea off your friends and saying, okay, if I've got this problem, what do you see this? And it can take them five minutes to be able to complete it. But that external insight is absolutely invaluable. And I'll apply that to two examples. Um, the one example was um, in our employment services, the... Um, uh, the employers were being saturated with applications that weren't fit for purpose. So it's taking up their time. Um, it's wasting their time. Um, it was wasting the, the, the job seekers time because we weren't actually being able to tailor it. And what was happening for larger organizations is applications were being fed through an automatic screening process. So we check it for certain keywords, 100 would go through, 10 would make it into the hands of an individual, they would get the interview. But that doesn't mean to say that they were the 10 most appropriate, they were the 10 most appropriate CVs. So what we did, and I'll come back to this in one of the tools that I have in a minute, is we reversed that and said, right, okay, if that is the problem, the problem for us, that the CVs are not being the job seeker is not adequately able to tailor their application because it's being scrutinized. So how can we pre-scrutinize it so that when it goes through that screening process, it actually gets out the other side. So we took the software that the business had and we put it in the hands of the job seekers. So now the job seekers were able to pre-screen every single application that they had matched and graded so that when they submitted it it was fit for purpose and it cleared the automatic screening okay what that meant is that for the 93 people that were in that program that pilot program 58 of them secured employment so we had a two practically a two-thirds success rate which was a lot higher than what we were having previously 
Okay, so that was that really understanding the problem and being able to reverse it for the client. Another example of this is um, in our um, HK facilities, uh, in our HK program, was trying to really um, educate our students on the ailments of old age. Okay, so if you're going to be working in old age, you really need to have a bit of the sympathy and the empathy for those people that you're caring for. But how can you fully understand it? If you are a fully mobile 25 year old, okay, it's, it's a little bit difficult. So what we actually did is say, right, okay, what we need is a way for the students to experience the pain of old age. So we did a bit of research. And we found an organization in Germany that creates what's called a GERT suit. And a GERT suit mimics the pain of old age. It can restrict your breathing. It can restrict your eyesight. It can um, imitate Alzheimer's. It can restrict your, your movement. It has spikes in the back plate. So as people sit down, the actual spikes go into the back. So you feel, so there is actually, it is inflicting a small amount of pain so that there is empathy of getting somebody and sympathy from getting somebody in and out of a wheelchair or in and out of the bed. So people are more able to identify with the client group. That has actually led now to a high 90s achievement rate and employment rate going into that industry for us. And that's all about really understanding the problem. Um, the other bits that I wanted to touch on, um, and there's a great, sorry, there's a great video on this on YouTube called The Solar Cow. Um, by, uh, and I'll put the, I'll send, I can send that through, or if you can find that and pop it in the chat. Um, and it's a real, it's a real eye opener of how identifying, I don't want to say anymore because it'll spoil the video. Um, but if you get a chance, the solar cow by yoke is an amazing three minute watch on really understanding uh, how important it is for the problem. Um, I wanted to chat a little bit, uh, as well about our approach to content, um, and how we go about tailoring the content uh it's called the solar cow uh one moment i'll see if i've uh here we go uh, we've got a link thanks nathan oh perfect all right perfect. yeah great uh, I'll just close that down. Perfect. Um, so I wanted to chat um, a little bit as well about um, our um, our approach to content and some of the tools that we use for this in being able to really tease out the discussion points. Um, so another one that I wanted to draw your attention to is something called the Board of Innovation. Okay. Um, if you could do the same for me with that, Rich, that would be awesome, yeah? Um, they have a range of innovation tools in there that are really des designed to take you out of your comfort zone when, you, um, when you're looking for service model design. And there's one in there particularly called, uh, one moment, I believe it is the brainstorming cards or the board of innovation cards it's a pack of 52 cards that once you are talking about a particular topic, you can pull a card out and read what's on the card to challenge everybody's perception of the service model or the point that you're actually talking about at that one time. Okay. Um, as I mentioned before, the solution generally presents itself. Yeah, that's it. That's the perfect one. The solution will present itself uh, with more clarity once once we found we've had that chance to have that discussion around stuff and really tease it out um, and those cards look at different things from um, a customer perspective from an innovation perspective it uh, legislation and i think there's one more um, and they're just some really good ways of being able to open quite a robust dis uh, decision uh, discussion and challenge the ways that different things are being used. They've also got a great one in there on the 17 sustainability goals, the sustainability development goals. 
um, on ways to actually incorporate that into um, uh, into the discussion and to be able to see, right, okay, are we actually working towards these goals and how can it be incorporated into the piece of work that, w that we're currently working on? I think that that's, it's a great one for, dis for external discussion. And I use them myself just to be able to pick one out at random and I use it just to be able to challenge myself, right? How can I incorporate this? Does it need to be incorporated? Why haven't I incorporated this? Yeah, and it really helps you challenge your bias. Now, we all have, whether we want to admit it or not, we all have an internal bias on whether on the things that we like, the things that we don't. And trying to fight that sometimes can be quite difficult. Um, so the tools that I use really try and challenge my own bias as well as that of my colleagues, which is as much painful as it can be fun. Uh, depending on the colleague that you're actually sparring with at the time. Um, but a good bit of verbal ping pong, I find, is a, is a good way to, um, to challenge me as well to say, am I off base with this or am I on the, am I on the right line? Um, and usually you'll, you, you'll know who in the office is going to give you the most blunt answer that you are looking for. And that's usually the person that you want to, that you want to ask for their opinion on something. Um, the other one that we use is a tool called um, Scamper. Um, uh, and this really allows us to be able to respray um, an idea that we've currently got. So um, there will be no doubt um, organizations here as well that are aligned to just a single service stream. Yeah, okay, this is what we do. This is, this is what we know and we're perfect at it. Okay, so what Scamper allows you to do is to take what you currently do and to add a little twist on it. And Scamper stands for, I want to get these in the right order, substitute. Okay, so what can we substitute in our current model? Yeah, that is going to provide additional value or benefit yeah what can we combine is there anything that we can change a process to make it easier so that it's easier for the client or it's easier internal internally what can we adapt or modify yeah what are the things that we can just change a little bit and we will get a new uh, a new revenue stream or a new way to approach the clients uh put to another use yeah how can we reuse this model for something else um eliminate and reverse so when i was talking earlier on about the software that we wanted to be able to put in the hands of the job seekers that's what we did i ran through this program and said okay with this software what can i do what can i substitute um what can i um what can i combine um, and none of those were working until I got to the end and it was only the reverse piece. Okay, if I reverse this on who actually uses it, then I'm actually finding a way to better identify with the problem with the client group that we've got. Um, I've covered on the board, the board of innovation stuff. The other, uh, um, this, is a, this is very much a brain dump as well, right? So I'm trying to get as much out as I, as I possibly can. So feel free to st um, throw stuff in the chat. I'll put my details in there as well. Feel free to contact me outside of the session if there's something that you pick up on. Um, I mentioned earlier as well about bias. So for us, if you lose a tender and if you, let's face it, if you've been in this game long enough, you're going to have that crestfallen feeling. Yeah, you're going to get the Dear John letter and go, oh, bugger, I put 40 hours of work into that and it hasn't come off. Yeah, I think that's just something that you've got to get comfortable with because um, it's going to happen. Um, and we go back to the vendor and we say, okay, thanks very much. Um, can I have some feedback, please, on why we didn't get it? And sometimes they'll be very good and sometimes it'll be just a generic letter and the generic letter goes out to everyone okay the other best piece of advice that i can give you with this is that you have to go back to the vendor if you win you have to go back to them and ask why you won 
And from that, you will build what we, what we have internally is a bias database. So we know that certain departments, certain funding, certain funders are facts and figures because they've told us, yeah, we know that certain funders are, um, yeah, we love the way that the case studies played out. Yeah, we love that. So we know which department, when we are writing our application, what we need to include because that is what helped the previous tender, yeah? That's not always going to work, and you obviously have got to temper that and index that to, to what you're writing at the time. Um, how do you, I'll come back to that one now. Um, so what we found then is that as soon as a particular department comes out, we, we already have a starting point to be able to say they like this particular service model and they like this, 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 and this. Okay, that doesn't mean to say we're going to include it, but it definitely means it needs to be considered. And all of that previous work that you've done on that one tender can just be trans, um, uh, trans, uh, transferred directly into this one. And that really allows you to give a really, really solid starting point. The other thing that we like to, or that I like to do, um, is to try and include things that I think that the vendor might want to hear that they haven't asked for. So I like to include the sustainability development, uh, development goals, even if they haven't asked about them, because they know what they are. And then if that is the decision between going between somebody that has spoken about it and somebody that hasn't because they like it, again, we're not going to get away from that bias. And we know that there's going to be a checklist that they're marking against. But if it comes to getting you into the next round, if it comes to getting you across the expression of interest stage, then you really have to put everything forward. You have to put your best foot forward. So I try to, for example, um, environmental policies are a good one. Um, I try to cover off on our the green aspects. What are we currently doing to try and combat that? Um, how? Uh, what is our in kind if they haven't asked for it? Um, what is the social change that we're looking to bring about by this? Uh, and for social impact, there are uh, many different ways. I think that that can be explained, and uh, I think the definitions that can vary for that can vary as well but for us that is all about the, the measure of change that we want to see yeah and we we use that as simply as just using a Likert scale a scale of one to ten on entry one to ten on exit and measure the difference yeah um and we found that that has been that has been very effective for us but asking for feedback on the successful ones you will be surprised what feedback you get in the feedback than the when you've been unsuccessful people usually have to be quite measured in their response because they're not allowed to overstep and and divulge too much but because you're asking them for feedback purely on your tender on nothing else not why you know where did it stack up were we on one to five did we come third or fourth were we second were we in the running was our price point good um, generally, the feedback on the positive, on the reasons why you were successful, is a lot more detailed. That's, that's my personal experience of that. And that has really allowed us to be able to build that up, or build the, those nuances up so we know that we can build those in. Um, and then going back and being able to check that against the selection criteria. Obviously, word count comes into this. Yeah, um, the dreaded word count. Personally, I much prefer something that is either 500 characters or 500 words than something that says that it's open slat up because otherwise there's just, um, you can just drift and go off and, and go off on any kind of tangent. But that's me. I prefer to write and then bring it down on, on scale. Um, the, other, um, the other thing that I wanted to concentrate on, I'll just mention as well, Simon Sinek very famously say, um, I'm gonna, I'll try and get this right now, he says, he says very famously, um, people don't buy what you, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. 
and in the very and he and he gives the, gives this beautiful example of apple. I'm not going to do that because I wouldn't do it any justice. Okay, so I'm going to approach that from a different angle. From a tender writer's perspective, people don't buy why you do it; they buy how. Okay, they buy how, and I think that a lot of tenders fail the initial um, thresholds because they have got too many motherhood statements in that are too general. Okay. If your statement is not adding value to how you are going to solve that problem, then it shouldn't really be in that tender because the, from, from a department's perspective, um, and I say that because they are, they're one of our main funders, the how is all about mitigation of risk. If they give you this contract, how are you going to make sure that, it, that they don't end up with egg on their face? Yeah, it's all about that mitigation of risk and financial risk. Concentrate on the how. If the how is not being articulated, how you are solving it, how you are going to get there, how you're going to create the change. And again, you can use the, 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 that scamper tool to be able to really evaluate this and the problem. The problem will help you understand the why it is there. Now you have to develop the program on, on how you're going to get it to the other side. Um, and that has been instrumental for us as well, so that when each part of the paragraph as we're writing is to go back and challenge it and say, um, is this adding value to how I am going to solve the problem? And if it's not, I take it out and I move it to one side. Because gen more often than not, you will not have the characters for motherhood statements and for blurb. Um, and if if they're in there, it, I think it will be just be seen as padding and you can automatically spot padding when it is not being, when, you, when you're not articulating either data or the how. And for the how part, we've, we've got a couple of different, uh, two sentences that we use. Um, we got feature benefit and outcome. So what is the feature of what you're trying to do? What is the benefit of that feature? How does that solve the problem? Okay, so the feature is what you've come up with. The benefit is what it's going to do. And the how comes back to one of those, the seven pieces of information at the front. Okay, so that's, that's from a product perspective. Okay, the other one that we use is situation, action, and outcome. So this is the current situation. If I do this, this is what will happen and how it is going to benefit the client, okay? So you can probably add how to the end of each of those. Feature, benefit, outcome, how it relates to the problem. Situation, action, and outcome, and how it relates to the problem, okay? If, you, if you're following those, that, the, that kind of structure, uh, whether it's a product based or whether it's a service based, it'll genuinely, genuinely allow you to um, articulate what it is that you're trying to do, why you're trying to do it, and what the result is at the end. Okay, um, so it's kind of a way just to be able to test what you were doing. The other, uh, the other way that we think that we build into that is for all of our, um, or for all of our service models, we build personas. Yeah. And then we give them names, Jack, Jill, Simone, Fred, yeah. Um, but we reference those in the actual uh, tender documents. So, because what we found is that um, there is a better identification with a named case study than with an unnamed case study, yeah, or with client, participant, yeah. So we actually show that we've given a bit of thought to an individual moving through the program. Yeah. Um, experiencing the feature, being in the situation, having the action and leading to the outcome and how that is going to improve their lives. Um, and where possible, we also base that on real life case studies to be able to say under the co-design process, um, we have interviewed five people. This is their expectation of the service. And then actually name the individuals and provide contact details then as well. 
way allowed um, so that the department can actually go back and, and check those references. And we've had a number of those happen where um, people that have been involved in that co-design process have actually had that call to be able to say, so-and-so has made this statement and this claim, is this correct? Yeah, to be able to make sure that they're doing their due diligence behind it as well. Um, one of the other, um, one to be able to pull this together, um, I try to, I'm more of a, a visual person. So we would map all of this out on our theory of change document. So we have our problem, again, coming back to that first bit that I started with, we have a problem on the left, yeah? We have the desired goal or outcome on the right. And then all of the stuff that's happened with the tools and the discussions, yeah? All of that gets mapped into the middle. Um, that formulates another discussion and then we start drawing the lines. Okay, how does this happen? How does that happen? This moves around back into here. This moves around back into here. Yeah, okay, that doesn't lead anywhere. So why are we doing it? Let's take it out. Let's be brutal with it. Let's add, add in what we need so that we create an, a direct link between the problem, the intervention and the end goal. Okay, and where possible, we map that back to the departmental document. So I'll just share something again here. This is another, uh, where's this one gone? Sorry, hang on one minute, um, cancel. I need that document. Share. Here we go. Okay. So you should see an example of one of uh, three. Has that come through for everybody? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So what we did here is that the actual diagram, the flow, is the work that we had done internally. Problem identification, all of the magic that happens in the center that you've spent ages working and diligently arguing with your colleagues about um, and then the outcomes at the end but what we did this little table down in the bottom the orange light orange for whatever color that is beige the green and the blue those are the departmental objectives for youth development okay so what we did is take each one of those and show how by the color it fits into the department's own mapping. So you're using what's being provided and, um, against them, okay? And you can see that some of these areas ad address all four, some of them only address one. But what we're showing here from the department, because they already knew this because it was their document, yeah? So it's very easy for them then to be able to identify how the different stages relate to each part of the policy that they are that they are trying to change or that they are trying to enforce and the change that they are looking to see okay um and part of that comes back to that use of bias okay what is it that we've got that they like to see you know people generally like to hear about themselves don't they so you know if this is what they're saying then how can we find a way to be able to feed that back okay um, that said, there are not a lot of times that we've been able to include diagrams in certain, uh, in certain um, uh, tenders. Um, it is the perfect way of reducing your, your word count, because if you snap that as a picture and embed it, it doesn't count towards the character count, by the way. So that's one other little tip. Um, but we found that that is really good as well for evaluation, uh, which is one of the main uses of a theory of change. Um, to be able to say um, at each stage of the program, is this correct and is this what's happening? So at the end, we can actually show the evolution of it and our internal audit of evaluation as well, meeting each of, each of those steps. So I'll just stop there, stop that one. Um, use of personas, bias, green policies. They were the main... 
Uh, I'm just looking at the other notes I've made, sorry. Uh, by a sewage change. Yeah. The other thing that we found um, is that there has been, I would say in the last six or seven tenders that we're going for. So we've got one, two, three. We've got about five on the go at the moment, two of which are due this Friday, I think. Um, um, and we're getting more, more and more questions about innovation. Um, how is your model going to be innovative? Yeah, how, which basically is saying, right, okay, how is it going to divert from the norm? Okay, how is it different to what is currently being delivered? How is it different to your competitors? And how is that going to deliver um, additional value for the clients that, that you're going to be working with? And again, what we found is that if you can find a way of challenging your initial assumptions about your own model, the innovation will present itself. If you have a model, yeah, and you can go through those innovation cards and challenge it, you will spark something that will say, we could do it this way. Is this our point of difference? Okay. Um, using the, the scamper tools as well. How is it that this is different? How can we create innovation by substituting, changing, modifying, reversing, putting to another use? Yeah. How can we make it more effective? How can we make it um, less of a burden? How can we make it more appealing? And by asking yourself that each time, what you find is that you end, you'll end up doing it by default because you'll have something there and you'll just constantly be challenging it and challenging it and challenging it um, until to the point where you're ready to actually push the button. Pre-submission jitters, everybody gets them. Yeah. Have I included all the documents? Have I dotted all the I's? Have I crossed all the T's? Um, we, I, I still get that every time. Um, and I know that Adam can be a bundle of nerves here when he's about to do it as well, because um, it's, it's quite a nerve wracking thing, especially if, depending on how much time that you've put into it. Um, but those were my main, those are the main takeouts that, that I had. Um, just coming back to the two strategies that I had, I started with understanding the problem. Um, and I gave those those seven questions that we use to really be able to understand that. The imagination piece, yeah, you get a lot of, well, no. I come up against staff that say, I'm not imaginative and I'm not creative. Yeah, I say, yeah, that's a lot of rubbish. Have you got kids? Yeah. Then you're constantly coming up with ideas to get them to eat their vegetables, to get them in the car on time, yeah? You're being creative just in a different region. You just got to apply it. In a, diff, in a different train of thought. And the way that we have found that we get the best buy-in from that imagination piece is by the use of two words, yeah? And we say, imagine if. So I can have a group of my clients here that have been really hard and social workers, yeah? They know, they know exactly what they're doing. They know what they're doing with their clients. But if I said, imagine if, you only had to spend four hours a week doing notes and you could spend more time with your clients. What would that mean? Okay, now they're off. They're off and running, okay, right. Imagine if we could automate the notes. Imagine if you, uh, you didn't have to spend so much time in the client home and they would come here, okay? Imagine if for us is very much about permission and you're giving that person permission to use their imagination. And that's all it's taken for us. As opposed to saying, how do we do this? Oh, you can't do that because we've got to have a minimum of 12 hours to be able to do our notes. Okay, imagine if you didn't. What would be, what would be, the, what would be the outcome? What would be the benefit? Just talk to me. And all of that goes on the board. And then we can use then, come back to the problem, come back to the other tools, and we can start drawing that down. And then that eventually funnels down, it funnels down, and funnels down, it funnels down, until we have something that we can work with that everybody has tended to agree on, okay? Um, if you start with the problem, get intimate with the problem, and let your imagination run wild, um, 
you'll find, I think you'll find that what you get out of it will be a lot better than just a very, very linear approach that I'm doing exactly what is required in the tender document because that's written to a particular format, to a particular policy to make sure it's above probity. But that doesn't mean to say that you have to take it at face value. Yeah, you can work in the gray area a little bit. That's fantastic, Nathan. Um, I had the, I, I put up two questions, but I think you might have answered both of them. So one of them was around that, you know, do you start with the theory of change and then you went into it, awesome. So, you know, that, that helps to, to bring those problems out and have that imagination space in the middle and, and create the outcomes you need. And also there's something that came up quite recently um, in um, a couple of articles that happened um, across the globe, sort of talking about the challenges of, you know, the, the focus that's coming out from COVID and everyone's sort of going, we need to drive economies, we need to drive jobs and it's really about um, you know that the, uh, governments will come up with policies that really de are determined by um, outcomes that they have or agendas that they have set and we see that in Australia a lot you know it's very very much jobs focused at the moment but you know for social enterprises who've also got a, a mission in the in the midst of that um, we can sometimes jump to the end space jump to that you know oh well, here's the money um, uh, we just need to get the, our hands on the money. And sometimes we forget uh, there can be a bit of mission drift, you know, as we sort of try and uh, appeal to the tender or the grant specifics. But that last, I think, you you know, starting with why is, is definitely great. But then the how, um, you know, helps to embed that. Internally, we have this document, okay? So before we complete a tender, this has got areas on assessing viability of our new undertaking so there's community staff volunteer and student financial commercial delivery of serve a delivery of physical services health and safety learning and teaching industry collaborations organizational culture and then risk yeah that that prevents drift if that doesn't get a positive score we don't do it doesn't matter how much money is on the table and we're very brutal about that because if we can't live to the vision and the mission of improving lives then all we're doing is chasing the money and that's chasing the money is not what wins you the tender the passion the pain and the purpose behind the writing is what is what wins the tender that's so awesome. Does anyone have any questions for Nathan? We've only got about five minutes. Rachel. Yeah, hi Nathan. I have a quick question. Um, do you suggest writing in sort of government speak or do you suggest writing from a storytelling aspect? We use their language in storytelling. I'll quote okay. Tyrion from Game of Thrones, there is nothing more powerful than a good story. Yeah, um, where possible, ours is that storytelling because it shows a flow. It shows the start. You got you know typical um, uh, story structures. While you got protagonist, you got the hero, you got the fall, you got the rise. Yeah, um, so we try and show that flow through storytelling. Absolutely, okay. but taking in mind the bias. For example, we know that certain departments don't mind a bit of story, but it's got to be backed up by data. So Great. have that lens on it. But for us, we apply storytelling quite a lot. And will you use quotes then from your beneficiaries or uh, people who are participating in the program? So direct quotes from them? Absolutely, yeah. Where possible. Um, and if the word count doesn't allow, I include that as an addendum. Um, um, and if that's the case and they ask for financials um, and that's the only addendum that they're asking for, I'll put it as a PDF and add it at the back. So it right. goes in with it. Then they can read it if they want to. Sneaky. Yeah. yeah. We've got a question from Matthew as well. Uh, um, thank you. Um, I did this quick question. Um, it did come for this funny time because I had a meeting with my uh, other social enterprise this morning. It's the member of the Impact Boom program a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I was saying that it's finding really interesting about um, and the council 
for example, economic unit that have an understand about the values and, and branding in terms of what your impact. So I have all the benefits to all the social impact measurements and everything involved. What about the employment stuff and training, social connections and blah, 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 so on. But is that not really encouraged thinking how that, that tender process to look at? Um, because it, it's, I look at about a company, about the social economic or the economy model. So we had a really good deep dive around um, looking at um, what you call the oh yeah, contact with somebody else. You um, work really well as stakeholder with um, let's say someone in the council team who let's say a litter prevention program. Mm -hmm. If you do someone in that team who um, knows your organization very well, it's your project, an idea, and you can develop a relationship, it could make it a strong process in the tender or procurement process. Is that what you're thinking to help encourage that process? Oh, absolutely. We have a, we have a strong relationship here with the economic development unit from our own council um, for, uh, and we provide res reciprocal letters of support but really understanding um, what you want what the value is that you are providing so it's understanding their problem if the problem is purely around economic and that's what they want then that's what you have to tailor it to but it doesn't help if you include some of the social aspects as well to be able to say that, okay, this is what you're, this is the bang for buck economically, but this is the social change that you're going to bring about. Um, so I think that is really about tailoring and know, and that's that bias piece as well of knowing where, what you, what the other person wants and how you can add value to that. But any kind of those relationships that you've got, they are absolutely definitely worth nurturing. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> and I will have to correct myself on the record. I, I actually called you the wrong surname. It's Nathan Spruce, of course. Um, I knew that. Um, but um, I just wanna say a quick um, thank you so much again to Nathan um, for his time and his energy. I do know it's like it's only one minute to go before um, uh, we have to wrap it up. I do encourage everyone to go onto the, um, the Queensland uh, Social Enterprise Learning Centre. Um, if you do need help with that, please reach out. We've also put into the chat room um, Nathan's email address. So it's nspruce at impact.org.au. Um, if you've got further questions for Nathan uh, at the end of this or something comes up for you, it might actually, you know, spark some, some questions of your own down the track. And thank you so much, Nathan, for opening up your, um, your generosity there to get people across the line with their tenders coming up. Um, any closing words from you, Nathan? Uh, no, listen, other than that, it's learn by doing, get stuck in. That's, that's the own, that's the only Sometimes they're going to be difficult, um, but if you push through it um, with a, a little bit of help, like I say, I'm, I'm happy to help out where I can. Um, but if you push through it, it will hopefully pay off at the end of it. Wonderful, wonderful. I really hope all of you um, had something to gain out of that wonderfully insightful um, session with Nathan. As he said, he's got a tender writing uh, course up on Qualc now the Learning Centre, so please make sure you log in and check that out. Um, also, our friends at Social Traders, um, they are um, great uh, help and guidance in terms of um, getting tenders through state government and things like that. So um, if you're not certified already, there is a free certification for um, QSEC members to, if you're, if you're eligible, if you're um, able to do that, you can uh, go and have a chat to Alex Hook from um, Social Traders and we can pop his details um, up for you as well at the end of this. Um, and uh, they do have some support mechanisms for writing tenders specifically for, for um, uh, government, government tenders more, more than anything, but um, uh, they can also support you there too. So there's loads to, to learn and loads to share 
it's wonderful that we've got such a great network of people in our ecosystem to help support our journey um, and really do try and connect and, and reach out. Sorry, Nathan, did you want to say something else? That's okay, yeah, just two things. Two, um, two quick ones to have a go at, right, depending on eligibility. There's obviously the social uh, enterprise grants that were advertised last week. They're due 1st of July, yeah, depending on eligibility. That's not a big, that is not a big application. Um, that would be a great one to cut your teeth on. And the other ones are the ones through the gambling fund that come out every three months that you can apply twice a year for, for up to 30 grand. They are also very quick ones to have a go at. Um, I like to say is that if people want to um, have a go at that, write it, send the text to me. I'm happy to have a look at it and critique it against the ones that we've won against those grants in the past as well. Oh, that's so cool. Thank you, Nathan. See, if, um, see how we get, see if we can get it to work. And in terms of tender writing, I know the state government's um, put out an, uh, um, uh, some information as well. So if you're looking for um, those larger pieces of procurement work, um, uh, there are some tenders that have come out from state government. Um, so have a look out for those as well. There will be more social enterprise grants coming up too. So um, keep an eye open for those. And uh, we're looking at doing some work with the Central Queensland University in July, I believe, at the end of July for a, another grants writing workshop. Uh, is on the card. So keep your eyes and ears peeled for more information about that as we go forward. But thank you once again, everyone, for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you in two weeks for the Changemaker Tuesday session. That will be about jobs-focused um, enterprises. Um, and um, always reach out to uh, myself or Leanne um, for support for anything to do with Queensland Social Enterprise Council. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for joining us, everyone. See you. Bye bye. I think definitely you should join if you're a social enterprise. Join us. We are a fantastic bunch of social entrepreneurs. I'll be looking to join an organisation like QSEC that could really advocate on my behalf. And it's really nice to meet other people that feel and live and breathe their work as well. You're not alone. So at the moment, there's the Gold Coast Network, we've got the Sunshine Coast Network. Um, Toowoomba, Logan, um, there's a Brisbane network and then of course all the regional centres. When, when I do get a chance to stop and take a breath and look back on what we've achieved, there is definitely a sense of pride. I want to make a bit of a difference to a, somebody's life. Didn't ever expect to make a difference to my own life.